Welcome to another Military History Verbalized podcast and today we talk about Soviet tank losses and claims and also German tank losses and claims on the Eastern Front in the Second World War and we have a special guest here today, Peter from the blog Tank Archives. Welcome Peter. Hello. Peter, can you tell us a bit about your background? Uh, well, so, I mean, I was, I was born in the Soviet Union, uh, that obviously doesn't exist anymore. I moved to Canada, uh, studied engineering here. So professionally, I'm, I'm not a historian, it's just a little side hobby of mine. But I've been blogging for just over five years now. Um, and I've been doing various translations of historical articles for, for even longer than that. So I'm kind of fairly firmly rooted in, in sort of the historical, I guess, community. M more so in the Russian kind of language circles online than others. Uh, and so what happened, I guess, five years ago is that it was really World of Tanks, which I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with, that pushed me to sort of start blogging in English uh, about Soviet tank documents. Because uh, I realized that World of Tanks, the, um, both the company itself and the various individual historians started posting scans of these documents. And on the English language forums, you had absolutely no one who, who knew about them. But the people who knew about them would try to post them and kind of, you know, do their best with Google Translate or with OCR to f figure out, you know, w what they contained. And since for me, it was really easy, I just kind of started translating them. And uh, here we are. Excellent. So you're doing a great service to the community. And also, I also quite regularly look on your on your blogs, but I, I never made it so far to do a video about it, but I plan to include them in the future. Now, what what is very interesting for me is, for instance, the in the loss and uh, in the loss comparison and everything. I know that the Germans and the Soviets counted differently. Can you describe how the Soviets counted their losses in terms of vehicles? What was the criteria and around this? Uh, so the criteria for uh, the Soviets and actually the British, it was a very similar criteria: is whether or not a tank can fight. So if a tank can fight. It's good. If it can't fight, it's a loss. Uh, a tank that's stuck in mud, a tank that's thrown in track, uh, all of those tanks are considered losses. And you'll see yeah, in the Battle of Kursk, Kursk for instance, um, I can't recall what unit it was right off the bat, but there was a unit that lost 30 tanks or something. And uh, I think 15 or 20 of them were just bought down. But they are, they're all counted as losses. And obviously these tanks come back. So I have a graph here from the First Guards Tank Army during the Lvov Sandomir's offensive. And uh, this graph was made by the repairmen who kind of were trying to hype up their contribution to the battle. Uh, and they have a, a graph of the number of tanks that remain in action, which kind of goes down to around 300, 200 tanks and bounces up and down as they repair these tanks. Um, and versus the graph of tanks available for battle that are not that are just reported as losses. So at that point, the army runs out of tanks oh, around two weeks into the offensive. So it's kind of a lot of these losses uh, that are recorded as, you know, these tanks have been lost in battle. These losses aren't really substantial. And as long as you have kind of a backbone and engineering, you know, recovery vehicles, you have repairmen, you have the spare parts you can kind of keep going forward really quickly and sort of absorb the losses. Uh, and this happens with Americans as well. You'll see a ton of units uh, during the Normandy campaign who report, you know, 200 or 300 percent casualties. That doesn't mean that they have terrible tanks and you can't, you know, re restock a tank division two or three times completely in the span of a month. It's just these tanks are being knocked out. They're being put back into action. Uh, typically, few crewmen will die, if any, because, you know, if your tank hits a mine, track comes off, bogey breaks off, uh, probably no one inside died, but it's still out of action for a few days. Uh, whereas with, with the Germans, the tank will have to be a, a complete loss in order for them to admit it. Uh, there's actually, so Yuri Pasherlock, uh writes, this is a very sort of, I guess, emotionally charged uh, paragraph. <laughs> But so he writes, there were no greater liars than the people who kept records of German tank condition. This started happening as soon as the war began. For instance, the Panzer IV that you see in Patriot Park was written off by the Germans on January 10th, 1943. In reality, it was lost two weeks before that. 
more precisely, they thought they lost it. So it was towed to the rear and later sent to Germany. As for examples where the tank was never officially lost, but was propped up on cinder blocks because it was slightly damaged and picked apart by a passing Kameraden, there is no shortage of those. Sure, they were later sent to the factory and repaired, but there were enough Panzer IIs like this in the spring of 1940 that production of new Panzer II stopped for half a year where old tanks were repaired. This happened constantly until the end of the war. So as, as you can see, this kind of these statistics are very misleading. Um, and you can argue indefinitely about you know, whose reporting method is better. Yeah, uh, I, I read, I think Reeser noted this in Germany, the Second World War Volume 8, I think. He noted that the Germans, I think, usually at the end of the month, they, they added them up all, all the losses. So usually you have at the end of the month, their losses explode and before that nothing happens. And only mm -hmm. after if they are completely out of action for several weeks or no, if the repairs would take more than three weeks or something, I think was the criteria for Germans. I'm not exactly sure here, but it was, it sounds completely different. Like, okay, the tank is stuck in the mud and we count this as a loss to that. What I so far read about Germans, what they count as a loss. It's basically two complete different words because the, the, the space between is, is really big because I, I would understand. So they also counted it as loss if the tank was stuck in mud because I would understand if it's get detracked in combat, for instance, a mobility kill, which is also a modern criteria, I think, then I would say, okay, I can count this at a loss, but counting already a tank as a loss if it gets stuck in the mud is, well, I think, it, also quite extreme. It would count as a technical loss and not as a combat loss. Uh, but oh, I mean, operational loss, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, at the end of the day, all these things get lumped together into your tally, and at the end of the day, the commander doesn't really care, you know. Or if the engine broke, for instance, on the march, that's technical loss. But uh, again, the tank is out of action; it doesn't count as in, in action. Whereas, you know, the, uh, even reading the German, uh, the Schneider's uh, Tiger Tank Combat Diaries, it's very interesting because every few days they'll report, you know. They'll say, we have this many tanks in total, or we have this many tanks in action, but they'll never sort of give you a full picture until, like you said, until the end of the month. So the other element is, of course, uh, then kill claims and losses. How, how you, I mean, I think you wrote quite a lot on this. So what, what usually the claims are, you, I mean, I know it from, from the air water, the claims are usually way too high for, for mm. every side. So what is your general experience on this one? Uh, so I have uh, an example from actually the Korean War. So this is an American after-action report written in June 1952. And they sort of total up all the, the tank claims. So the Air Force claimed 2,554 enemy FVs destroyed. Uh, the Navy claimed 433. Ground Forces claimed 143. And so the total number is 3,130 tanks. So this all kind of makes sense, except that even during the war, intelligence estimates only expected the North Koreans to ever have between 600 and 700 tanks. And yeah, and examination of tank hulks uh, shows, what was this? so there were around 300, depending on who counted, there were around 300 vehicles found on the territory that uh, the South Koreans kept. And it's estimated that there were maybe 75 north of that. So uh, the actual number of vehicles lost is 10% of the number of vehicles that were claimed. So you have these, you know, these amazing discrepancies and nobody was trying to make themselves look better. I mean, I hope, but it's just, uh, this, this study does go on to say how it would be impractical to review footage or, you know, compare tactical markings on, on photographs or something like that. Uh, and just most units just report, you know, what they did. So if they shot up a tank that was already immobilized or destroyed or abandoned, they would report it as we destroyed it and just kind of keep going. And I mean, this is what, what people need to keep in mind. If you're out there on the battlefield, it's something different like in a computer game. You do, usually don't know if this tank you see there, the silhouette, is this a tank, maybe is it just a house? And you shoot at it because it could be alive and if you make an error you die or your comrades die so better shoot first and ask questions later whereas in a computer game you always know you you won't die and and also you usually know for instance in warfund or world of tanks you can 
immediately tell the difference between a destroyed tank and an operational tank, whereas in real life, this this isn't the case. So I, it's it's probably more understandable that they say, okay, we shot that tank, and maybe later on, or they don't care if it actually was non-operational at that point or even abandoned. Yeah. So the example they give is you have your air force close air support. They strafe a tank column. The tanks will kind of turn off the road, maybe get stuck in a ditch. They say, you know, we disabled three tanks. And then later infantry comes across these tanks. You know, maybe the tanks got out of the ditch. They keep driving. They'll fire on them with bazookas or recoilless rifles. You know, maybe these tanks, one of them will start smoking. They'll kind of drive off the road, quiet down to kind of conceal themselves from further attack. Infantry will say, oh, we destroyed or disabled three tanks. You know, maybe they, they blow up one of the tanks or set up, set an engine fire. Uh, and later on, armor will come by and they'll see these tanks there. They'll shoot at a tank that already burned out, but it's too far away for them to see it. They'll detonate the ammo rack. And it definitely looks like there was a tank, they destroyed the tank. But you have this kind of multi-claims over and over on the same three tanks, effectively, uh, which is no, yeah, like you said, there's no way to tell what that is, what you know, what you're shooting at. Yeah, and especially, I mean, the first planes they attack, they attack three planes. Then there are several trucks nearby. They also see, okay, there were also tanks, and you have like the, the air force gets like ten times the numbers that were actually there. Yeah. Uh, and then we get sort of to the intentional misreporting. So in Steven Zaloka's review of the book Sledgehammers, which details it's not as thorough of a history of the fighting of the German uh, heavy tank battalions as uh, Schneider's books, uh, but I'd say it's a little bit cheaper, a little bit more accessible. Uh, so then Zaloga writes that the author seems unaware that the Wehrmacht's own intelligence service on the Eastern Front, the Fremde Heere Ost, regularly discounted German army kill claims by 30 to 50 percent. The author's assertion about the lack of Soviet lo tank loss data is unfortunate, as there is no evidence in the book that the author reads Russian, has read many of their Soviet unit tank histories, or has conducted any archival research on Russian issues. So that's sort of... Uh, the other problem is that people will take these kill claims at face and, value, yeah. Yeah, and face value. And as the logo goes on to say that uh, the, the author of the Such Hammers uh, compares a few there's there are a few, few engagements on the Western Front in Normandy, and he compares German claims and the British reported losses and says, Oh, yep, that looks right, you know, therefore they're trustworthy. But again, he's ignoring this thing where the British, much like the Soviets, if a tank was disabled by mines, if a tank was disabled by infantry, if a tank suffered mechanical failure, all of this would be reported as a loss. So if the Germans, the Tigers claim to have destroyed 10 British tanks and the British claim to have lost 10 tanks, you really have to go into the unit history and see you know, what did they lose these tanks to? Because there's, there's no sort of, there's no guarantee that it was actually the Tigers responsible for doing it. Yeah, so the, the devil is basically in the detail, and if you just compare tables, it, you will definitely get it wrong because, yeah. I mean, I, I noticed this, for instance, before I started my, my channel, I, I never knew basically that there are operational losses, and I, I never knew how, how high they are. I mean, for plane systems, they make up for 50% operational losses. Nobody outside of military history professionals basically talks about that 50% of all airplanes get lost in, in training or in regular accidents or in, in just, yeah, moving around. It's basically yeah. you don't see this in a movie, you don't see this in a game, you don't see it in a newspaper usually. So this is something like completely arcane. And if you write a book about this and you don't know about this or the, 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 uh, the, 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 how you counted the losses, then of course the the results will be yeah basically complete bullshit. Yeah, uh, there was um, a tally of sort of the vehicles that fell out during the march that a Soviet unit. Uh, I don't have this tab open right now, but uh, it's, it's, it is on my blog. Uh, as the Soviet Union kind of tallied up how many of their vehicles would survive marches and. Yeah, the T-34, uh, about 70% 70, 70 of them that were lost were lost in combat. 30% were lost on the march. I mean, they break down. And again, there's there's no kind of recording of what the severity of this breakdown was, but they'd break down enough so they wouldn't be available in time for battle. Uh, for other tanks, for example, the Matilda, it was 
for the T60, it was 60%. So yeah, so the, these, these tanks, they're run very, very hard, very mercilessly by people who don't necessarily have the greatest appreciation of, you know, all the work that went into them and they have their objectives to complete and they kind of have to push, you know, give it a hundred, literally give it 110%. So yeah, they're, this happens in every army. Vehicles are abused, and oftentimes there's not enough time for maintenance, so they will fall out on the march. And if you're counting these losses as combat losses, then well, it's not not exactly a proper way to do history. Yeah, I mean, we also we are basically now we are our reliability rates of vehicles and of technology we have nowadays. It's it's insane if you compare it to back then, because back then not very much was reliable. And, and they also tanks were rather new, really new technology. So nowadays people freak out if, or I freaked out a few years ago when Windows crashed every day once. <laughs> but I mean, if you talk about Matilda, I think 50% losses on the march, it, it just gives an impression. I mean, how, how, I mean how, how much kilometers I drove with cars are probably more than 100,000 kilometers. And I think I can remember one, or two breakdowns with so and most people have something along those lines such experiences like every 10,000 kilometers you have a you you have to get a service or you have a breakdown but back then it was probably I think I read in a German manual for I think for the Tiger I think every 10 every 10 kilometers I think it was that you had to to stop and do a, a maintenance check or something to well, see yeah. everything is all right. So every 10 kilometers, and nowadays we have vehicles that drive 10,000 kilometers, and the only thing you have to check is probably oil. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I don't have warranty figures for the Tiger, but uh, for the Allies, so the Americans did these grand trials for reliability of Sherman tanks, where each tank was put through either 400 hours or 4,000 miles, whichever you know, it reached first, and the vast majority of the tanks did not make it. So um, out of the tanks with the right engines, none of them made it. Out of the tanks with the diesel engines, I think I think one of them made it. Uh, and out of the tanks, Chrysler engines, it was three out of the four, uh, surprisingly enough. And out of with the four GA engines, it was also, I think, three out of four. Uh, I don't have these features, but yeah. Um, and the Sherman has this history of being an amazingly reliable tank and yet the M all the m4a1s were out of action after 166 hours of peacetime driving yeah that's insane and especially considering that i think the united states has by far the best production quality and experience and, and everything around this in the second world war ii yep so yep. for everyone else it was way worse oh yeah and you had uh there were earlier uh when the Lee tanks, the M3s, are just coming into service, you had these kind of unqualified personnel who would say, oh, there's a fancy new tank, let's drive it into the ground. They have no idea how to maintain it. They were reporting that tanks were needed complete engine refurbishments after only 100 hours of driving, which is kind of insane. Because on, on the Soviet side, the V2 engines, the T-34s, the warranty period was also 100 hours at the beginning of the war. It's yeah. actually quite interesting because on, on the Soviet side, uh, the opposite happens. People were saying, you know, we want these new T-34s, they're great tanks. And they put them under a tarp and they wouldn't do anything with them because if they broke them, they won't get another one. Uh, I have a memo actually from the factory that builds the engines begging the army to actually use their new tanks. And, you know, they're saying, these you drive your tanks, we need to observe the engine wear, we need to see how how well it stands up, what parts fail, what we need to reinforce for the engine to get more reliable. Uh, but but then the war started, so they really didn't have time to iron out sort of any of the kinks. Whereas, like you said, the, the Americans they had the advantage of being overseas, um, as well as having a very mature automotive industry. They were overseas, they were kind of protected from this. Yeah, and they also have to take into account, since they have to ship across the Pacific or the Atlantic all the time, that their stuff is more reliable due to logistics. I mean, this is this, the, they have a complete, I always say, if American forces want to fire one bullet, they first have to figure out how to cross several thousand miles of ocean. Whereas, for instance, the logistics Germany have to take into account 
if they want to shoot one bullet, it's basically, yeah, um, let's march up on, on the border to some <laughs> one around. And this also is, needs to be taken into account that the, the co complete background and the whole thinking and design structure is something different. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, like I said, I have an engineering background and it, it really kind of irks me when people use the term over-engineered. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the point of engineering is to make kind of a product that meets requirements. Yeah. If you have something like the Tiger or the Panther that's one and a half or two times heavier than it was supposed to be in this absolutely massive you know, completely has nothing to do with initial requirements kind of machine. You didn't over-engineer it, you engineered it poorly. And in America or in the Soviet Union, they'd say, you know, what, what is this? It doesn't, it is not what we ordered, make it again. Uh, because yeah, you had these very strict requirements. And I actually, I'm, I'm sure the Americans had this as well, but I haven't seen any American documents, but I have seen a Soviet one where in the T-40 tank, they uh, thickened the roof by two millimeters. And this resulted in a weight gain of several dozen kilograms. And this is a meeting between two factories where they were going, okay, what, what can we change to shave off, uh, this was, I think it's 90 kilograms. What can we do to shave it off other places? So they took out one of the two shovels, they simplified some parts, stuff like that, you know, over very few kilograms. Whereas the British in North Africa were noticing that the Germans are... Uh, so when they first examined the Panzer III, they, the British just said that, you know, there's maybe two tons of reserves in terms of weight before this tank will, will break down kind of very quickly. And they noticed that the Germans are piling on more armor, they're piling on bigger guns, they're piling on sandbags, they're piling on extra track lengths. And the weight of this, even you know, the Panzer III isn't kind of known as a very heavy tank, but the weight of it compared to the original design was skyrocketing. And so they had uh, the British captured an intact Panzer III, which marched for only 1,600 kilometers. And the engine was completely clocked out. Like Its top speed was 26 kilometers an hour. They said, you know, we want to do mobility trials. We can't because this tank is just unusable. Yeah, I mean, this was a large problem, I think, in Germany, because with the military and the, and the civilian producers, basically, they, they didn't really work well. And from, from what I read, basically, in the, in the Soviet Union, it was um, planned economy from the very get-go, so we f you fixed that according to these regulations. And in the United States, it was basically the civilians more like, okay, we can't do this, or okay, we, we can produce this along these requirements. Whereas in Germany, it was this weird mixture of of military that had a dislike for the engineering to a certain degree and dictating stuff and and uh, and the industry not sometimes really telling okay that that's insane guys they were more like okay well then we just do this and you pay us anyway oh yeah uh when well, the soviet union uh one of the kind of stereotypes i suppose is that you had this perfectly oiled machine where you know stalin would say i want you know a, a new tank in the next morning, he would have one new tank design on his desk, and the day after that would be in production, and everyone was happy. Whereas the reality was there were also multiple design bureaus. Every every factory had one. There were uh, very fierce competitions going on between them. And they also sort of interpreted requirements very loosely. So uh, there was a project to, so you kind of know about the KV-7, where Stalin said, okay, I want a tank that has three cannons all pointing forward. They all need to fire at the same time. Uh, they actually made this at the Kira factory. Uh, and they made 20 prototype hulls before Stalin was, Stalin was convinced that, okay, all right, this, this tank actually sucks. Let's not produce it. <laughs> Whereas, you know, in, in Germany, this thing would be on the battlefield at some point. Uh, and there was another project to use up the, the hulls. And the, the end design had nothing to do with with these hulls that were already built and so the project was scrapped and nobody went ahead and said oh you know since you put in all this effort we need to build it no matter how much it costs cost was actually a very sort of driving factor even though it was a planned economy this people people you know it's not a bright communist future where their money is eliminated right uh, you need to pay the mines to bring you coal and steel you need to pay the factories you need to pay the workers uh, you need to pay the allies to bring you whatever from 
from overseas um, until the Lend Lease Act was passed. So it is very important and financial. There were accountants, there were financial meetings, there were ways were found to cut costs. So there are times when, you know, Stalin would say, give me this, and someone down below would say, it's impossible, you can't have it. So the Soviets tried to make an assault gun with the BR-2 152mm cannon. So if you played uh, World of Tanks, so the S-51 has it, the Object 212 has it. It's this kind of huge bunker buster. And they wanted to put it in a closed casemate and the front lines. And uh, the government kind of designed these requirements for it, saying you step this much armor, it needs to go this fast. And the engineers came back saying, if you want this gun this much armor, you cannot meet the weight limit can't be done and you know you often read on the internet about how oh engineers that said no to Stalin would be executed immediately and that that didn't happen uh it's not to say engineers didn't get executed but they didn't <laughs> they didn't do it for saying no you know it can't yeah. be done uh and the most famous kind of case where the kind of highest profile case where an, a high ranking engineer was punished was with uh Ginsburg the creator of the SU-12, which later was renamed to SU-76. Uh, his mistake was that he, from the very beginning, he chose a poor engine layout, which resulted in a breakdown to the gearbox. But once it was realized, and once his factory, without because he's saying, no, it's everyone else's fault, it's the gearbox's fault, it's the assembler's fault. Uh, his, fa his own factory staff were actually meeting in secret away from him and drafting solutions to this issue while he was running around blaming other people. And in the end, when all these kind of mass breakdowns were happening, all these units were sending their tanks back, the government said, hey, this is your fault. It's not anyone else's fault. These guys actually had to try to fix it, and you screwed up. So he was fired, and he was sent to the... He was assigned as the deputy commander of some technical unit. Like he did end up dying in the battlefield, but you know, it wasn't like firing squad tomorrow morning or something like that uh or you kind of see in some less reputable internet sources where that would happen to you immediately and that's not really the case i think you were mostly for political reasons it could happen but but less for design fields from what i yeah. read yeah so i mean if you look at kind of the kv the kv4 tender where there were a dozen projects, each one more insane than the last. If you were shooting people for failures, you would have killed off a lot of them. But these people later became very prominent engineers in Soviet industry, both during the war and after. Uh, even the ones putting out these completely untenable, you know, 120 ton tanks, 180 ton tanks. 180, okay. <laughs> That's a yeah. lot. Oh yeah, so uh, <laughs> it's actually a very interesting story what happened. Um, so the, so the Red Army had the KD-1 uh, by the spring of, of 1941, and they had the slightly improved version called the T-150, so to have a slightly bigger gun, slightly more armor, commander, scoop, a better engine, better suspension, you know, very minor changes. And then intelligence reports came in saying that Germans were building a 90-ton tank with a 105-millimeter gun, and these reports show up in British intelligence as well, uh, which is, so it wasn't it was either very good misinformation or they were actually working on something like this. So the Russians went, you know, they said none of our future monetization pro programs, you know, none of them are going to survive against this thing. We need to build the KV-3. Uh, again, the, the one that's known in the world of tanks is the KV-3. There are actually several vehicles under that name. Uh, we need to build that this year. And then in 1942, we will need to build either the KV-4 or the KV-5 depending on which one does better in trials. So kind of if the war had started, uh, you kind of have all these alternate, alternate history scenarios or if the war had started, you know, six months later, three months earlier, uh, two years later, three years later, something like that. Well, what these people don't account for is that the Soviet Union was planning things too. And so it would have ran into a drastically different kind of uh, army, drastically different armored force if that had happened. Yeah, yeah, I actually, a video should come out soon or when this podcast is released, it should be coming out because a lot of people in this alternate history scenarios always assumes a complete passive other side. They, they mm -hmm. like they are playing a computer game. So I only do this, but everyone else don't react. 
and I think yeah. it's it's best visible in the in in the naval sphere because then you can directly see that that for instance the Dunkirk class was built with that kind of armor which could defeat the 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 shells of the Deutschland class and nothing more. So where where you can actually see that they always always countering the enemy designs all the time. Whereas on the tank side it's 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 less visible usually to a certain degree because it's it's way faster than with ships because ships you build several years and you design them also several years or even sometimes decades. Whereas for mm -hmm. tanks it's it comes down also to years and I yeah usually years but well, you see, you see it a lot um, in scale modeling, specifically with tanks. You have those kind of Panzer 46, it's called, where people are theorizing about what would happen if the war had gone on. Uh, and what they don't kind of realize is that the Germans in 1945, they weren't trying to beef up their tanks. They're trying to simplify the design. Yeah. So the, the E-series, you know, it, it wouldn't be significantly more powerful or in some cases at all more powerful than what was around then. Uh, and you see kind of these hilarious spaceships on tracks, basically. <laughs> People saying, oh, the Germans definitely would have had this, like, it was a, you know, the, the E-100 with, like, a portable V-2 rocket launcher on top. You know, I, mean, I mean, that actually wouldn't make sense. I, I was planning to do a video because the Germans <laughs> tried, basically, on, I think they tried a, a submarine launch of the V-1 or even the V-2. Then they also tried it with the, with the Heikel 111. So actually, this would act probably happen that they put it on a tank as well, because they they had a fascination of putting all their view rockets on something. I don't know. Yeah, but they're also they're also putting in these amazing, huge, hilarious guns. You know, like the uh, L1, you know, 128 millimeter L100, 150 millimeter uh, world of tanks. Kind of imagined at first, I think, where they put. These completely impossible cannons on the Tiger II and the E100 and all these tanks, and the scale modelers kind of ran with it. Uh, and these tanks are kind of expected to turn the tide of the war. But what they weren't realizing is is that the Allies weren't sitting still. Yeah. So the Soviets by 1945, the Soviets have the IS-3 in production. They have the T-54 already. The prototypes are are being worked on. The T-44 is already in production. Um, oh, the, the IS-4 will enter production soon. On the kind of American side, you have the T-29, T-30 tanks. Uh, you have, on the, the British are building the Tortoise. So there are these kind of completely different class of vehicles currently being planned, right? And unlike the Germans, were, whose factories are being bombed out, they lost their industrial kind of supplies in Czechoslovakia. Uh, and the, the was the, what they call it, Bohemia and Moravia. Um, they lost France. They lost kind of uh, raw material supplies. So the industrial balance was in favor of the Allies sort of throughout the war, and it was becoming more and more in favor of the Allies. So kind of this sort of wishful thinking about, oh, well, the Germans magically, you know, summon some tanks from thin air. It doesn't really work. Yeah, I mean, as you said, uh, to a certain degree, they, they focus more on standardization, making them produce more easily, because this was also a major lack in in, in the German industry. The standardization um, was lacking. They only had, I think, one manufacturing belt, which was in for tank production, and this was in St. Valentin, near Linz, where I live, basically. And and it was also the Nibel Lungewerke, which they only did it for end production. And the problem is some they usually nothing happened because some parts weren't coming in. So if you have a train production and you have a manufacturing belt, but half the time it doesn't run because you don't get the parts from somewhere else in the Reich. Yeah, so much for that. So so this is what a lot of people don't see with the whole resources and the other other elements or with these paper well, projects. Yeah, uh, the Soviets actually had a similar problem um, in sort of the summer of 1941, obviously, where all the industrial regions are being captured, their factories are evacuating, the whole situation is in disarray, and they created the People's Commissariat of Tank Production. And the People's Commissariat of Tank Production, which was kind of like the equivalent of a minister, uh, he had absolute power over factories that produce tanks. You know, you can't say like, oh, well, this factory doesn't want to produce, you know, because uh, it was a Krupp. Every single time Krupp made some component for someone else, they try to 
muscle their way in and everything else. They'd say, oh, we're making a turret. Well, we're going to make a new turret platform. Well, and we're making a new turret platform. Might as well make a new tank. And you kind of had this power struggle between the factories going on. Whereas in the Soviet Union, if you try to do that, they're going to tell you to knock it off. Yeah. And there have been sanctions, like financial sanctions against factories, saying that, you know, you should be building what we tell you to build and not, uh, you know, what you want to build. And there was a sort of the not invented here syndrome. So um, the um, Karka factory, they didn't want to build the T-60 tank. They wanted to build the um, uh, HTZ-16, the armored tractor, because it was their tractor and not someone else's tank. And they were told to knock it off and do what you're told because you are, you know. Yeah, this was, I mentioned before, that in Germany there, there was always this, most people think of, of, of Germany's totalitarian regime, which which everyone did what they got told, but this never happened, and to a certain degree, at least not on the industrial side. It was always the industry. The industry was, was quite powerful, and also the various different ministers and, and realms. So to a certain degree, it was more of a kingdom where Hitler chuckled with the different power players. It's it's way not that structures like, as you said, here in the Soviet Union, where they say, okay, knock it off. So yeah, it was something in between the Soviet Union and the United States, but they had basically the not the worst part of both systems, but pretty much from the efficiency standpoint, it was severely lacking. Yeah, uh, there's, there's actually a very good lecture uh, that's floating around the internet. Uh, most of your listeners have probably seen it. If not, you could put a link in a download or something where it's an analysis of the amount of steel imported or produced by Germany versus the amount of steel produced by the Soviet Union and uh, the United States. And Germany actually produced or, and received more steel during the war than the Soviet Union. But their tank production was much lower, specifically because of this, because they couldn't use it effectively. Yeah, I think they had a... I, I, I forgot the number and where exactly, but I think it was uh, in, in Mechanisierung des Krieges from Pullman. And he noted, I think, that the waste of how much steel they wasted for producing one tank was, I don't know, several tons or something. Like more than 50% of, of the steel or something was was lost due to the, during production, whereas the, the US lost way less in, in this regard. Mm -hmm. So this is also, well, yeah, how much do you lose on time, on money, on, on other stuff when you produce a tank? And something I, I have to read up on as well. Yeah. Uh, so when they were in the Soviet Union, when they were creating a new generation of thicker armored steel, one of the requirements was that when you're smelting it, you have to be able to use uh, byproducts, byproducts from manufacturing other steel and kind of scraps of, of existing steel. Uh, because they realized that if they're going to go into a major war, it's going to be an industrial war. It's going to go on for a long time. And you see, even in, in June, July of 1941, there's orders coming out saying we need to, uh, there's deficit materials being used in our engines. Uh, there's a lot of aluminum being used. We're not, we don't have a lot of aluminum, so we want alternative designs to kind of uh, build the V2 engine with cast iron parts instead of aluminum parts. So it's a very sort of realistic uh, approach to resource management. And not just saying, oh, well, no materials are coming in. I guess we can't do anything. And yeah, yeah, that this was the issue with the Germans. A lot of visual thinking. I mean, I know it from, from the Air Force, for instance. They had a limited amount of engineers and everything, but they, they're getting more and more projects like, okay, we have now three or four um, anti-air rockets designs running around, but we're already, we already lacking 200 engineers anyway for one. So, but yeah, let's make three more, and I guess probably for the tank, it was for the tank production, it was very similar, and and with resources, of course, as well. So I think we we got a bit off track here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I I do have some some more notes. Um, so we were talking about the the fifty percent figure. Yeah. Um, so fifty percent of uh, let me scroll back up. So it's the logo saying that from German. Uh, heavy tank battalions, their tank or tank claims should be discounted by 30 to 50 percent. The 50 percent figure actually comes up somewhere else, which is interesting. Uh, this is an interrogation of Joachim Piper after the war by the Americans. Uh, and he was saying that the one who quietly and bravely did his duty caused no comment and in his seclusion remained the fool. 
And the one who did a lot of hollering, making an elephant out of every attacking mouse, was officially commended and on top of it received quick aid in cases of emergency. Untrue reporting is an innermost disease of any army and must lead, always lead to false estimate of the situation and to wrong conclusions. And this is kind of what you were saying before, is that uh, they were working off what wishful thinking, what they wanted to happen, rather what was actually happening. Uh, saying that in the course of time, command realized of many frontline reports, 50% should be disregarded. However, this procedure had no bearing on the actual situation. Many a small, honest commander was expected to do tasks which were sheer madness and which had to shake confidence in his superior. At first, the orders were followed. Later on, one was satisfied with telephone report of fictitious combat accounts. So, yeah, it's, it, these battlefield commanders are, are working off wishful thinking rather than what was actually happening, uh, which, which to me sounds like complete, you know, complete madness. How can an army work off such uh, uh, such reports well i mean the, the answers it couldn't since they lost the war but uh, I, I don't know how anyone thought this could possibly ever work yeah i mean at a certain point and i think in the beginning there the reports were probably still quite accurate but w once the war went on and and everything it is probably gets gets way more problematic i don't i actually never heard of this but yeah it kind of makes sense i think i always heard that for instance the but Whitman at Willows Bukhash, how much he shot, and they actually most of them were armored vehicles like brand carriers or other stuff and mm -hmm. not really tanks. This is something I, I have to take a closer look also with, with Kursk, the battle, because uh, recently I read what Freezer wrote about there with the biggest tank battle and, and all this stuff that in some cases there were quite a lot of losses, but sometimes due to, to errors made and, and other stuff and all them with, with the loss count. So it's it's the deeper you go, the more it's like you realize, well, we don't know for shit. It's it's like yeah, yeah. it could be everything because do you have an honest reporting here? Do you have, have a dishonest? What do you know about the enemy numbers and, and how they counted and everything? So it's, it gets really complicated at certain points. I mean, for instance, I mean, one major problem and where a lot of people get angry is if you talk about uh, Hans Ulrich Rudel, the, the Stuka is, mm -hmm. who killed according more than 500 tanks but i mean the thing is it's for certain i believe that the numbers of his combat uh, flights are correct and they're more than 2500 and if you survive more than 2500 flights with a stuka i mean he also flew a focus i think at certain point but mainly with the stuka uh yeah you 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 eventually kill quite a lot or or have quite a reputation or you must be extremely skilled and very lucky but the question is how many tanks or vehicles he really destroyed is basically impossible to discern because he, because at this point or later on it was mostly defensive fighting so they couldn't verify the numbers. Yeah, uh, well it was uh, a few years back there was an interview with uh, Otto Carius while he was still alive and he said that you know uh, all of my numbers in my official biography they're all nonsense. You know, I talked to other tank aces after the war and the numbers that they are quoted to have claimed, they're also all nonsense. Uh, so it wasn't even them making the claims. It was someone above them saying, well, you have this amazing guy. He only claimed like 10 tanks in this battle. Doesn't sound right. Let's give him 20 tanks. So you can't even really blame them. Uh, it's just kind of the, the, the system that they were in. Yeah. Uh, so you, you said that it's, it's hard to verify. Um, even now, back then it was even harder, but I found a very interesting document recently in British, um, in the Canadian archives, so they had British documents in there as well. So this was an analysis of the German operation in Kerch uh, in August of 1942. And they write that, although the claim to prisoners during the main offensive, unlike the earlier claims, may not be greatly inflated, it is felt that the figures for material, especially tanks, bear no relation to the truth. So, uh, the British, even from kind of very far away, just through their intelligence work, were already sort of seeing this, that German reporting was something sketchy was going on. Yeah, that's, Kirk was, um, this is um, near, um, on the Crimean Peninsula on the eastern part, right? Yeah, so this was, so Kerch, the Kerch operation was sort of an attempt to retake Crimea by uh, landing forces from the Kuban and sort of, instead of going through the very narrow pass in the north and the operation failed uh but it was sort of this 
very insignificant sideshow, especially uh, Stalingrad was just around the corner. So uh, it wasn't really a major kind of, I mean, if, you, if you look at major Soviet offensives, it wasn't, it's kind of like a, a blip just sort of on the side. So maybe the, the people writing the reports felt that, you know, we defeated a Soviet offense. So it sh- should have been a lot bigger than what it was. So it's kind of padded out. You know, it's obviously, you know, 70 years later, 75 years later, it's hard to know what they were thinking or why they did it. All you can see is, is what they did, uh, which kind of, you know, you wish you could come back and kind of find out why something happened. Because it, you look at what happened, it just makes no sense at all. There's always another discussion because I think, um, I think from a German historian, um, he wrote uh, his thesis about um, Wehrmacht in Stadtkampf, um, Wehrmacht in urban combat, and he actually noted, but I couldn't verify it yet, that for instance, that Glantz noted for the Battle of Stalingrad that the Germans had way more units or may, way more troops. But he actually looked at the numbers the Germans would have had because they were not full units and noted actually what Glantz wrote were too high numbers or way too high numbers he assumed for the Germans at this point as well. So it, it goes always back and forth in, in, in this area. And usually Germans are, I mean, German military historians nowadays, they are not in the business of, of doing anything glorifying or, or racking up the, the kill counts for the Germans. Usually they are actually way more critical than, than um, for instance, other historians on the Wehrmacht. So mm-hmm. this was quite surprising to me. So, and, and I don't assume that, that Glantz did anything intentionally wrong here. It's just, and, and I need still to verify it. I mean, I read this a few years ago and I don't have the book because I had it from the library and I moved to another town. And so, so this was actually quite interesting. I, I, I remembered that back then, but I said, okay, I, I don't have ex- enough experience to look into this yet. And, and I think I actually have to dig this out again. So there's always this back and forth. Then, oh, okay, I mean, this, this is what I see, for instance. I read um, an article about the Battle of Taranto, the, the raid on Taranto for the British um, attack with the swordfish bombers, the, the Italian fleet in port of Taranto. And, and I think for a long time it was, uh, in military history circles, this was a major attack and was very important to keep the Italian fleet at bay. And this guy who wrote this actually said, well, it was quite, it, this, this said quite a lot, but it was very insignificant. It was only a tactical victory. Because if you look at the other factors and so, there was not much influence. And, and I read this and I was like, I get what you mean, but I think he, he overstated this argument that he put it down to a tactical victory due to because before it was seen as a strategic victory. Whereas I, from, from my perspective, was yeah, I think it was an operational victory, basically. So that you have this, this, these arguments going back and forth sometimes where, like, you have these people all inflating the, the tiger and the panther all the time for, for years. And now everyone says, okay, are they all just unreliable piece of crap? And I'm usually, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> there must be something in between this, like... You see what I mean? There's always yeah, this back yeah, and forth sure. that that's, that you have a, a, a basically always a counter and, and they're always adding like 10 or 20 percent more just to drive the point home. But but mm-hmm. sometimes it, it gets a bit missed what, what else is there. Because if everything was made up by the Germans, then then for instance, I would say, yeah, how could they, f- they fight on for so long at this point as well if all their yeah. reports were wrong? This is what where I come in. So okay, this sounds yeah, that's interesting. But then at a, another point, it doesn't add up with the with the other reality of the war again. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So this this similar thing happened in the Soviet Union and you know later in Russia, where the, the Soviet tank books uh, in the history books, you obviously had to say that the Soviet tank was the best. You know, T thirty four was the best. Uh, it had a 76 millimeter gun, you know, the Germans only had a 75 or 50 millimeter gun, uh, then it had an 85 millimeter gun, and you know, it's almost as much as like a, a Tiger, for instance, uh, which, you know, uh, and then in, in the 90s, when this whole kind of thing collapsed, people, little bits of information started coming out, and it flipped the other way, we're saying, oh, everything Soviet's terrible, all these German tanks were amazing, and you had kind of these, let's, let's, very generously called them historians, like uh, 
Victor Savorov, um, who's wrote these insane conspiracy theories that somehow have taken. So there's been book after book kind of examining everything he wrote sentence by sentence and saying how it's absolute, you know, nonsense. Uh, but at the time, it was very kind of revolutionary because you have generations of people who have been kind of in this information bubble and any new information was considered to be credible. And then sort of in the early 2000s, uh, it was called the Archive Revolution, where the archives of the Central Ministry of Defense specifically and various other smaller regional archives and the Economics Archive, they became open to the public for the first time ever. Um, and the information that started coming out of there just sort of showed that all of these blanket statements were like, oh, all the German tanks suck, all the Russian tanks suck, uh, you know, they were obviously false. Yeah. But nuanced, nuanced information doesn't make headlines and doesn't uh, create true. too much, uh, um, too much emotions. And so it's, it's, e it's easily lost and only nerds like we talk about this in nuanced terms. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's, yeah, so there's this historian called Mikhail Sivirin, uh, who's died quite recently, but he was sort of the first, he's the first generation of, of uh, Russian historians that he spoke, he had very limited access to the archives at first, obviously, but he would speak to the people who had worked at these factories, uh, the people who worked next to these designers, some of them were still alive and they would share their own personal archives. And he created this, you know, whole new generation of, of books that revealed just details that have never been seen before. But at the same time, his work started a lot more myths because he was working off a of very you know, unreliable second, third-hand, second-hand sources. So uh, Pashaluk, um, the kind of historian that most people know of the uh, play World of Tanks, he a lot of his work kind of goes over what Sirian wrote and sort of corrects it. Because, I mean, this guy brought a heap of information to the public, and he's a very, very respected person. But some of the things he wrote were wrong. And like you said, uh, with, with Glantz, it was not through no fault of his own. But it's just, that's kind of how the field works. You know, you make a breakthrough, and then someone corrects it, and someone corrects that correction. And sort of, sooner or later, it'll kind of settle down to somewhere that you could call the truth, I suppose. Yeah, a more dispassionate view on the topic because we got so so many arguments and and the distance to it also increased by time so that that there's less less emotion involved to a certain degree or nobody cares anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not true that nobody cares, uh, which actually kind of shocked me. So um, I live in Toronto and there's very little in the f terms of war museums or anything like that here. Uh, there's I think. There's a few memorials, but nothing really kind of major. Uh, I, I went to France recently, and in Paris, there's a ton of war museums. There's all these streets named after battles, uh, subway stations named after battles. Uh, you know, the country has some so It's an amazing tank museum. So it's kind of, uh, if you go to Normandy, especially Normandy or Dunkirk or any of these places where the battles actually happened, uh, everyone knows about them, this kind of tons of very interesting museums and places to see so i guess it, it very much depends on where you live yeah actually i didn't know that i mean i heard it a few times that france has quite a lot but especially in normandy but it's kind of interesting i never have been to france maybe i, I should change that oh, uh, <laughs> yeah definitely uh i recommend it don't go go in the summer because when i went i went in uh just in march to normandy and a lot of museums are closed Yeah, I can imagine. A April, June is sort of the, the big tourist season, but March, not a lot of people come, so uh, they're closed. Well, do we have any f any points left? Oh, well, we did bring up Kursk, so I guess I'll, I'll cover that. Uh, so he writes that the um, 503rd Heavy Tank Battalion reports seven out of 45 of its Tigers lost in July, but... 32 of its tanks were unavailable for battle because they were under repairs when the Soviet counteroffensive began. And so, you know, if you look at kind of the losses, so it's like, oh, you have 38 tanks left, right? If you lost uh, seven tanks, but out of those 38, only six were actually ready for battle. And if you report to your superiors that, oh, we lost seven tanks, they expect you to 
kind of be a defensive bulwark against any offensive. Where you know we have 38 of the newest, greatest tanks we have. The Russians can't do anything against them. It's going to be great. And then the Soviet counteroffensive just kind of sweeps through the unit, barely noticing it because they have six tanks in reality. Uh, so, yeah, and you were saying that the Soviet reporting style is very extreme. Yeah. But in these in these kind of situations, it Makes gives sense. you a more accurate representation of of the picture uh, than than the German one. I really need to look up how the how the Germans then accounted for this because I mean I, I doubt if they were always that misinformed on the upper level. This this I mean this would have had way more dire consequences in the in the, in the, in the early parts of the war already. I think because yeah, it's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean the other thing is that these tanks that need repairs aren't always necessarily immobile. Uh, so they might be ready for combat, but yeah, but they're they're, they're the workshop company, at the maintenance company usually, or 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 not or not or, or basically in the rear area to a certain degree at least. Yeah. So that's quite interesting. I, I really need to look out on this if I can find more information on the top of it. I actually got a diary from a a, a general staff officer from I think, mm -hmm. but I think. I think it's it's he it was in an infantry division or something, and it's quite interesting. I found a few things in there. I barely read it, and there was some some stuff that was like, okay, that's quite insane, in many ways. So maybe maybe there's some information on on that in uh, on that in, in in this book. So kind of what you mentioned that there will be dire consequences to this kind of accounting. Uh, this happened to the Soviets before the war, so there were the kind of battle worthiness system the way it was laid out is that there were categories of category one was a competing new tank category two was a tank that was used and was ready for combat or could be made ready for combat by the kind of efforts of a single crew and then you had various degrees of not ready for combat like medium repairs uh major repairs complete refurbishment but the thing is so typically when people go into you know, there's the whole kind of 22,000 tanks, right? The Soviet Union had, the Germans only had something like 6,000 tanks. And all these Soviet tanks suddenly disappeared. And the way the people that got to this 22,000 tank figure is they would say, well, all the tanks are ready for combat. So that's category one and category two. The thing is, category two included tanks that could be repaired by a single crew. So if a tank had no track, you know, a single crew could put on the track, obviously, right? But the thing is, there were no tracks. Yeah. So the, the plan, the plan for spare parts was at something like twenty-five percent. So out of this enormous tank force, it was sitting around. It was effectively just uh, pillboxes. Yeah, and yeah. I, was, I think Alexander Hill wrote quite a lot from how much how much they lacked on fuel and diesel and everything. It, it was kind of insane when I wrote it in summer nineteen forty-one. Like. The, the, I think the, they had 5 or 10% of the fuel they needed. So I assume with spare parts, it was rather similar. Yeah, uh, well, you had a very interesting kind of accounting situation where a unit would say, we have, you know, 500 liters of fuel or 5,000 liters of fuel assigned to us. And that would go in all the reports it's assigned to us. The question of where it actually is is typically not raised in these reports, and oftentimes that fuel is in Moscow. Ah, it's well, it's it's an essential fuel, fuel depot, and it's assigned to you. You can have it when it gets to you within a few months, and when the Germans are bombing all the all the railroads, it's not going to get to you. So, you know, all these these tanks were just abandoned because they, they couldn't fight. Uh, and um, one of the people whose documents I cite extensively, uh, Shen, um, he tried to calculate how many of these tanks were actually ready for, for battle. Um, and it was something like, uh, I don't have the figure here, but it was a very much smaller amount. It was uh, 4,000 tanks. Uh, oh, there, there I found it. Uh, he estimates seven to 7,500 tanks were actually ready for battle. So less than a half. Yeah. Yeah, about uh, one third would be operational out of the twenty-one or twenty-one, uh, twenty or twenty-one thousand tanks. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and there were shortages as well of tractors, basically every other kind of supporting vehicle imaginable. Uh, fuel trucks, trailers, prime movers, uh, workshops. You know, I, have, I pull up the page here, and there's just thousands or tens of thousands of, of vehicles that were missing because the army was expanding so rapidly to kind of meet this eventual threat. Uh, and that's that's how they found themselves in the summer of 1941, which is kind of explains why Stalin was doing anything he could to postpone the start of the war. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, for example, and this was kind of all across the board. So uh, these fancy new tanks, they came out with, you know, these huge 76 millimeter guns. None of the German tanks could withstand uh, this kind of caliber of gun. The, the army's demand for 76 millimeter armor piercing shells was satisfied by 12 <laughs> percent. So actually, I, I read an interrogation of a uh, German tanker who's saying that. He was uh, driving a Panzer 38C, and he was saying that we're not afraid of these new tanks because they only fire their machine guns. They don't fire their cannons. We're more afraid of the smaller tanks because they actually fire their cannons. Yeah, it's a 45 millimeter gun, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was still kind of a very viable weapon in the summer, but it's just kind of uh, a <laughs> very interesting situation where you have these great new tanks, but no fuel and no, no ammo to yeah. run them. So... Yeah, that's pretty. I think I, I covered this to a certain degree in my wider sword losses were so high during Operation Valorosa because there was a lot of stuff not ready and, and other many many other aspects which people usually usually miss. And if you look at the losses the Wehrmacht faced, then you see okay, uh, if there, there's something, the losses are extremely high. And this is also what what is reported in. I think the General Staff Officer notes that like they the the fighting is really fierce and everything. So. It was not the pushover that for a long time was proclaimed what Operation Barbarossa was. Mm -hmm. and which, yeah, is, a... which would be a disservice to, to both sides, by the way, because, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was actually listening to a lecture by Alexei Saev, who is another very uh, prominent modern Russian historian. And he said that if you compare a, a Russian infantry division, like a fresh one, that has not seen any fighting at all in the summer of uh, 1941 to a uh, kind of un under strength drained division fighting in Kursk in 1943. Uh, the latter was actually more combat capable because it had already mobilized properly. Everyone was, you know, everyone was still alive, but everyone was in their place. Everyone knew what they were doing. Everyone knew where all of their equipment was. Whereas in the summer, it was just kind of uh, chaos, basically. Yeah. I mean, this is also the thing with, for instance, the the Anschluss, the, the German occupation of Austria. They did a a, a partial mobilization of the, of the of the German army, for this several divisions, and including a Panzer division or at least one Panzer division. So, and then they realized, of course, oh, so, some stuff didn't work. And then we drive into Austria and we realize, okay, too many vehicles break down and it takes too long that we repair them. Okay, we need more we need more maintenance companies and everything else. This is something which all the and this was not even a war action. So in, in summer 1941, when when the Wehrmacht basically won several campaigns already, they are at the peak of their knowledge and exp expertise, and they have veterans and everything. So they had a complete different combat performance initially than everyone else at this point, because they they have peacetime experience and also wartime experience were available which also a lot of people don't i mean it, it's hard to understand i think if for 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 people nowadays be, because also i mean i grew up before the internet so certain information you find like now in three seconds on wikipedia back then meant you would have spent at least two hours because you had to go to the library you find the book where it's written in for instance, what gun the T-34 had. You, you had to spend at least two hours doing this if you didn't have the book at home. And, and, and this is all with the learning experience, which in, in the Second World, basically a tank, most people didn't ever see a tank of the soldiers or where they saw it from, from far away. I mean, if you look at the, the millions that attacked and then you look at the thousands of tanks and I say, okay, that's, that, that's a ratio of... I mean, 6,000 tanks around, you said, for Barbarossa, and I think it was about 3 million men. 
So we have a 1 to 500 ratio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this this is what what's for us nowadays a tank. It's yeah, okay, yeah, this is this tank and that. And back then this was this was kind of an arcane thing because they didn't have Instagram or, or Twitter to share the, the pictures of tanks or what types, all the information. It's 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 a complete general the complete information flow nowadays today is is I think probably thousand or ten thousand times higher than it was back then. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, even now, kind of, you can't just train it in theory. You have to do it in practice. Uh, for example, when they started training infantry with these new tanks, the KV-1 and the T-34, they noticed that in first gear, the T-34 was slightly faster than KV-1. So when the T-34 was escorting infantry, the infantry had trouble keeping up with it because it was going... Uh, slightly faster than walking speed and when you're laden with all kind of arms and equipment they kind of had to jog after it which tired them out really quickly whereas the kv1 would drive at walking speed and it was fine to follow it uh but th this is one of these things that you know you can have access to all the information you want but once until you're actually out in the battlefield you're not gonna kind yeah. of figure it out uh and, and like i said none of the units that were issued these tanks wanted to ruin them so they just sit there under a tarp. Uh, and it was specifically a tarp and not a garage because this... Um, so you, uh, Shane's book about the T-34 kind of in the summer of 1941 goes over how these the units that used it were formed. And basically there'd be a new armored unit formed. You know, all the soldiers would receive their orders. They would go to the kind of location where that what they were assigned and there would be a field. Uh, and they would start building barracks and they start building garages, but and they start building tr training schools because some of these bases, you call them very loosely, uh, they had not, no buildings at all. And they're reporting that we have all of these top secret new tanks. They're standing out in the field next to a road with a tarp over them. Anyone passing by can see them. Help do something about this. Uh, and they did start kind of improving the situation of course but it just wasn't enough it wasn't enough time and again you know we had all these alternate theory uh alternate history kind of fiction writers saying that oh what would have happened if the war started a year later well then all of these problems would have been solved and you would have tanks with soldiers who actually trained on them and instead of spending their entire day building a shed well i, w I would say 50 percent of the problems would have been solved <laughs> Well, I mean, <laughs> more than none, you know. Yeah, uh, I mean, def definitely there, there would have been a lot of problems solved because, yeah, this is quite quite a difference. And and they would have had... So the other thing is just completely unbelievable when I read it is that there was no, no manual. The T-34, the KV-1, um, uh, the BT-7, even with the BT-7 with the new diesel engine, there were no manuals. The manuals were due to be written in by November of 1941. So, you know, imagine that you're kind of fresh faced recruit. They said, congratulations, you're going into a tank unit. You've never seen in your entire life anything bigger than a motorcycle. Uh, you show up in this field. Here's a tank. You can't drive it. Here's its engine. We have no manual for it. Good luck. Right. Um, where the only way to solve this problem is time. Yeah. Time and practice and everything. Yeah. yeah. So, well, thank you very much, Peter, for this valuable insights and this very interesting chat. Oh, you're welcome. Good to be here. And people, if you want to check out Peter's blog or on Twitter, I will put the links in the description and we will also put the links to various mentioned books and, and the talk you mentioned um, also in the description. So thank you, everyone, for listening and see you next time. Bye. Goodbye.